Hey, we're live. Quiz number one, solve the following. Leave your final answer as a fraction if it doesn't work out evenly. I'm going to show all my steps. If you didn't do every single one of these steps, that's fine. I've already told you, I kind of like you to learn to do some stuff in your head. But if I was doing this one here, I see variables on both sides. I would probably go uh, minus 3x from both sides. If you went minus 5x from both sides, that's fine. If you used, I've seen a couple of my international students who use a slightly different method, that's fine. I'm concerned, do we get the same answer? So minus 3x from both sides, the negative 6 would drop down. I'd have a 2x plus 7. I would minus 7 from both sides. If you didn't do the quiz, you can decide one of two things. You can fill the quiz out as we're doing it right now as kind of a learning exercise, or you can say, I'm going to watch, and then I'll try the quiz on my own, and at least I'll get the benefit of trying to practice the questions because your test is going to be really similar to this. But you need to decide what you think will help you learn the best. Uh, minus 7 from both sides, minus 7 from both sides, and I get negative 13 equals 2x. You get x equals negative 13 over 2. Is that right? So if you get that, 2 out of 2. What if you didn't get that? Yeah? Sorry, I can't hear you. It was a positive. I take a half mark off if you lost a negative. Would that be a fair way to mark, I think, on a two-mark question? I think so. Pardon me? I, as long as one of them is negative. You know what? The rule for fractions is if the fraction is negative, you put the negative either on the top or in the front. It's not wrong leaving a negative in the bottom, just like it's not w wrong to walk around with stuff hanging from your nose. But if you want friends, you probably don't want stuff hanging from your nose. If you want math friends, you don't want to leave the negative in the bottom. Specifically for me, if I'm marking really fast, I won't look for the negative down there, which means I might miss it when I'm marking. But the rule is, look, the fraction is negative. There's a single negative. Put it on top or in front. But I won't take marks off. Okay, and I answered your question as well. Otherwise, I would probably say something like this. If you subtracted the variables to both sides, I would give you a half mark for that. If you uh, added 7 or subtracted 7, or if you did the other way, plus 6 to both sides, if you did that step, I'd give you a half mark for that. And if you somewhere along the way clued in, you had to divide by a 2 or a negative 2, depending on what you did, I'd give you a half mark for that. 2. Number 2, 3 marks. Why is question number 2 3 marks? One extra step gathering like terms. 3x take away 4x, I'm pretty sure that that's actually negative x and the minus 8 drops down. Here I don't have x's for like terms, I would just drop the negative 5x down. Here I have a negative 12 plus a 7, I have a negative 5 I think when I gather like terms there. I would give you one mark for that if you got that far. Now I've turned it into the previous question. You could either go, you know what, I'm going to go, I think, plus 5x to both sides here because that gets rid of more negatives. When I do that, I'll get a 4x, a minus 8, and a negative 5. I would plus 8 to both sides. I'll get a 4x equals negative 5 plus 8. 3, positive 3. Uh, x ends up being, how do I get the x by itself? Divide by 4, divide by 4. x ends up being 3 over 4. If you got 3 quarters and you didn't show every one of those steps, I'm good with that. You get 3 out of 3. Otherwise, I would, if I was marking this, give you one mark for that line. I'd probably give you one mark for this line. And I'd give you one mark for or half a mark for dividing and half mark for the final answer. Yes? First question, did you get the same answer as me when all said and done? Okay. Then if you're not sure, later on when I start to collect these, I'm going to start out by saying before I collect them, anybody want to come lawyer with me now is the time. Bring it up and I can tell you instantly how I give you the marks. Okay? And that way I can let you know where I give out the part marks. That way you know for the test as well. Number three. Yeah. What is a negative divided by a negative? I'll give you full marks for that, but I'll also give you the frowning of a lifetime because you wrote extra stuff that you don't need to. It's like putting the ones up there as exponents. Yes, there's always an invisible one up there. It's like putting a one in front of an X. Yes, if the X is by it, so there is an invisible one there. Come on, we don't need to. Number three, what am I going to do first? 
Yo, oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Um, I did all the road rates back there, and then at the end I wrote 2x, and so I I'd probably give you 2 out of 3. Yep. On a test, I'd probably give you 2.5 out of 3, but I'll mark the quiz tougher because I want you to find the test easier. What am I doing first here? Get rid of, yeah, I'm going to say get rid of brackets. I'm worried if you say front door bomber, if people haven't had Mr. Rock, they're going to, what, you terrorist? What the heck, what, huh? So get rid of brackets, and we'll all know what we all mean. Okay, fair enough. Uh, to get rid of brackets, I told you I always draw the little loops because it gets rid of most of my dumb mistakes. Let's see, I'll get a negative 10x and a plus 15 equals negative 8x and a plus 6. And now... It looks exactly like number one, sort of. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll go with red. You could also plus 8x, but I noticed if I plus 10x, I'll get rid of negatives. Woohoo! I'll take that. Uh, the 15 will drop down like a domino. That becomes a 2x plus 6. And now we're on pretty familiar territory. Minus 6 from both sides. I'll get 15, take away 6 is uh, 9 equals 2x. Nicole, how would I get the x by itself? Divide both sides by? Absolutely. x is going to be 9 over 2. You got that? 3 out of 3. Otherwise, one mark for that line if you got rid of brackets properly. One mark for getting the variables to one side. Half mark for dividing. Half mark for the answer. Number 4. Okay. Brackets and like terms and variables on both sides. So I'm going to get rid of brackets. Boom, boom. Careful, that's not a 2. It's a negative 2. I'll make sure when I multiply, I treat it as a negative, Tatiana. And, oh, I'm not going to write it, but what number is after the negative in front of the bracket sitting right here? It's invisible. Yeah, I'm going to assume that there's a 1 there. You can write it if you want to. I won't take marks off. I just never will. Oh, we have a visitor. Sorry, but that. Let's continue where we left off. You're going to get, and now I'm going to write a bit bigger because this is going to take a bit more work. A 5x, a positive 4x, chunk, negative 2 times positive 5, a negative 10 equals a 10, a minus 2x because it's negative 1 times 2x, and a negative 1 times a negative 1, a positive 1. Now I'm going to gather any like terms that I can. I got a 5x plus a 4x. Hey, that's a 9x. The minus 10 will drop down like a domino. I've got a 10 plus a 1. That's an 11, and the minus 2x will drop down like a domino. And now hopefully I'm on familiar territory. I'm going to plus 2x to both sides. That's going to give me 11x minus 10 equals 11. I'm going to plus 10 to both sides. That's going to give me 11x equals 21. Is x 21 over 11? Is that correct? People are nodding. Woohoo! So four marks if you got that. Otherwise, I'd go one mark for getting rid of brackets, one mark for gathering like terms properly, one mark for getting the variables to one side, half mark for dividing, half mark for the answer. Yes? You just forgot the 10? I'll give you a 3 out of 4 and the frowning of a lifetime. Uh, by the way, the, the sloppy mistakes like the, the forgetting ones, those are the toughest ones to get out of our system. My Math 12 students, after every test, are always furious because getting rid of what I call the mistakes, those ones where you look at it afterwards, you're like, what was I doing? Those are very tough to get out of our system. Very tough. Any success? No. Simplify the following completely. Okay. I'm going to get rid of brackets. I'm going to get rid of brackets. When I do that, I get, okay, numbers times numbers, 3 times 5, 15. I have two x's. I got one more x. It's going to be an x cubed and a single y. Numbers times numbers, I'll have a negative 6. I got 
an x cubed, and a y squared. Numbers by numbers, I'll have a positive 9. I got an x squared and a y squared. I think that's correct. 15x cubed y minus 6x cubed y squared plus 9x squared y squared. How many terms are there in this answer? So since it's worth two marks, a half mark off for each wrong term. If you get all three terms wrong, but you knew you were supposed to multiply, you at least get a half mark. That's how I would break this up into two. Number six, FOIL. 15x squared minus 6 plus 20. Uh, minus 6 plus 20 is uh, plus 14x minus 8. That was in my head. Is that correct? Woohoo! Ain't so bad. How many terms are there? Three. What's this out of? Two. You know what I'd do? I'd give you a half mark off for each term that was wrong. But if you clued in that you were supposed to foil, if I saw that somewhere, I'd give you an extra half mark. Number seven. Okay, I'm not doing this in my head. <sighs> I'm going to get, when I multiply the first factor, 6x cubed plus 8x squared minus 4x. I'm going to get, when I multiply the second term, minus 9x squared minus 12x plus 6. I don't stop here. Now I gather like terms. Um, I got a 6x cubed. Took care of that one. I got 8x squared minus 9x squared. 8x squared minus 9x squared is negative 1x squared. Yes, you can put the 1 there, Colleen. I'm not going to put the 1 there because I'm lazy. I got a negative 4x minus a 12x. Negative 4x minus a 12x is negative 16x's. And I got a plus 6 that drops down like a domino. How many terms in this particular answer? 4 for 3 marks. Half mark, first of all, if you got it right, 3 out of 3. Otherwise, half mark off for each term that's wrong. But if you started to do this, you get at least one mark for starting and cluing in that it's multiplying. Can you give yourself a score out of 3, 9, first page out of 19? Put a little score out of 19 in the bottom. Makes it easier when you're doing your adding. Turn the page. It says graph the following equations on the grid. Clearly label each line with the appropriate letter. One mark each. This guy here has a y-intercept of negative 6, and it's up 1 over 3, up 1 over 3, up 1 over 3. Ruler, here we go, here we go, here we go. There's line A. Uh, no, but I would say try and do three. Like, don't just do two and quit because your ruler might... The, the more you do, the easier it is to line up your ruler. If you just do two, all your ruler has to do is slide just a tiny bit. You won't notice it because your dots are so close, but you'll be way off further on, right? I'll be okay with it. Uh, do uh, And again, Tanner, on the quiz, if you didn't put arrows, I won't be fussy, but in real life, we should clue in... Hey, it goes forever. Uh, in Math 10, you would have said the domain is all reals. Uh, B... Y-intercept of positive 5, and the slope is negative 2, which means down 2 over 1, down 2 over 1, down 2 over 1, down 2 over 1. Also, Tanner, I have to be honest. This is me again. I have enough of the 6-year-old within me that I still enjoy connecting the dots, which is lame, but it, honestly, I'll freehand this one. So there's line B. By the way, you know how I mark these? For one mark, if your y-intercept is in the right place, that gets you a half mark. And if you did the slope correctly, 
that gets you your second half mark. Make sense? C. Ah, it's not in slope intercept form. I have to get the Y by itself. I'll do that over here. I would go minus 3x from both sides, which would give me negative 2y equals negative 3x plus 4. And then I would divide by negative 2, divide by negative 2, divide by negative 2. And I will get y equals, Colleen, what's a negative divided by a negative? So I don't need to leave both the negatives there. I can just get rid of them. Absolutely. And what's positive 4 divided by negative 2? Negative 2. So this equation has a y-intercept of negative 2. I'll go uh, green for this one. And a slope of 3 over 2, which means up 3 over 2, up 3 over 2, up 3 over 2, up 3 over 2. Just one second, folks. And it would look an awful lot like that. We'll press pause because we have some visitors here. What's the 70s? Yeah. Polyester and ugliness. Uh, the 60s is, I think, more of the flower child thing. The 70s, 70s had bell bottoms, for example. Oh, those were just, up, you know, styling. Uh, hideous polyester colors. Disco was 70s. You, oh, you're grade 12? <laughs> Is next Friday a day one or a day two? I'd have to go look at my agenda. Meanwhile, let's continue on, please. We'll talk about the rest of it later. Uh, the last one, y equals negative 3. What's weird about this one? What's missing? No x, really. But yes, there's no slope. This is a line. This is a horizontal line, negative 3 high. This is a line that's going to look like, shh, quiet, please. This is a line that's going to look like that. That's line D. Then it is possible to get a bonus question as a bonus. This one here, this is a line that's going to go through, well, I know it goes through 1 comma 1. I can do that. And what's another point this one goes through? Uh, good God, Mr. Duke, you didn't make this the easiest one. 8 take away 3, 4 negative 1. This line looks like this. So the bonus line goes through 1 comma 1, negative 2 comma positive 3, positive 4 comma negative 1. Looks like that. Give yourself a score on this page out of 4 please. You could get 5 out of 4. And then at the very, very top, give yourself a score out of 23. If you have a question about your quiz, now is the time to come lawyer with me. If you're wondering. So we're on page three. We did a quick review of using the cross multiply method to solve. Let's finish off today's lesson. Oh, come here. And again, I'll be honest, I agree with my colleague over here. This is not my, wow, I really love doing this stuff. But it's useful. It says this, using unit or dimensional analysis to convert. So this is the third method. All three of these are valid. I won't make you use any specific one. You can use whatever you like, whether it's the ratio method that we did at the beginning, whether it's the cross multiply method that we did at the end of last class, or this one here. What is unit analysis? Unit analysis is when you have to build a chain of fractions in order to get from one type of unit to another type of unit. You can do it all in individual steps and that works perfectly fine but if you want to do it all in one fell swoop you can do that as well. For example, uh, example 4 says in class example 3 we use proportional reasoning to convert 0 0.05 miles to inches how could I do this using what's called unit analysis? First of all, it asks what conversions will the student need to consider to solve this problem using unit analysis. We want to go from miles to inches. If I look at this chart here, do I have anywhere on this chart miles to inches? No. What do I have? Miles to what? Yards or feet, which one of those will help me? 
well, I have feet to inches. So what we're going to write here as our plan of attack is we're going to go from miles to feet to inches. Write that down. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a fraction chain. And the way I'm going to build the fraction chain is the first thing that I do is I write the measurement that they gave me. In part B, they want me to convert 0 0.05 miles. I write that down. Page 3. Point zero 0.05 miles. We want to end up in inches. And we said first we're going to go from miles to feet. And the way we're going to show that is we're going to go times. From the previous page, from that chart, what is the conversion factor? How many, mile, how many feet are in one mile? Someone want to read it, please? Let's turn back a page, I realize. 5,280? Okay, put your pencils down, look up. The question kids have most often is, do I divide or do I multiply? That's really the most common question in unit conversion. The nice thing with this method is it tells you. Put your pencils down. Suppose you thought you had to go one mile is 5,280 feet. This is incorrect, which is why I said don't write this down. This is incorrect. And here's how I can tell you that it's incorrect. What units are on top right here? I want the miles to cancel. The only way I can get the miles to cancel is if in the next fraction I have miles on the bottom, which tells you whether you're dividing or not. So I'm going to erase this. Right away I think to myself, I want the miles to cancel. Pick your pencils up. So I'm going to put the one mile right here and the 5,280 feet right there. There's the first link in my chain. Times. And then I'm going to, with my pencil, cross out the miles because I've just taken this from miles to feet. Apparently, I'm going to go 0 0.05 times 5,280 divided by 1. But Colleen, am I going to bother dividing by 1? Will that change my answer at all? No, but if there was a number there, I would divide by whatever number was there. Now I need the conversion factor between feet and inches. So from that chart, how are feet and inches related? What's the, what's the conversion factor? One foot is what? OK, and once again, Jacob, I want to put the feet on the bottom because I want this feet that's on top to cancel with these feet that are on the bottom. And you said it was one foot is 12 inches. And when I do it like this, woohoo! Feet cancel. You can use whatever method you wish. I'm much more concerned with can you get the right answer. I almost don't like the fact that the book is showing you three different methods. I would usually go with one. As a math nerd who is comfortable with fractions, I use this one all the time because I don't have to memorize stuff. But you can use whatever you want. Here is the point. I can now see what the answer is. The answer on my calculator is going to be 0 0.05 times... 5,280 times 12, and then it would technically be divided by 1, divided by 1. Am I going to bother dividing by 1? Is that going to change my answer at all? I'm just going to hit enter. Yes? Proportional reasoning is one fraction equals one fraction. You do an analysis, you build chains of fractions. He asked, what's the difference between the first method and this method? Uh, semantics, really. It's, it's, it's a term... Technically, if you're using proportional reasoning, you're going one fraction at a time, one step at a time. This, you're not. Uh, the answer is 3,168. Is that what we got in example three on the previous page, too? I hope, I think. Woohoo!
Unit? Inches. Jacob, where does this method work a little bit better? If you're doing more than one conversion at the same time. Example five. Physics student was required to convert 75 meters per second into kilometers per minute. What am I going to have to do here? Two things. I'm going to have to go from meters to what? Kilometers. And I'm going to have to go from seconds to what? Minutes. Here's how you can build a chain. I start out with 75 meters per second. Times. What do you want to do first, meters to kilometers or seconds to, or to minute? doesn't matter. We're going to do one at a time, but which one do you want to do first? Seconds? Okay. Where is the seconds in this first fraction, on the bottom or on the top? On the bottom. So for me to get it to cancel, I need another seconds on the top. And I'm going to have minutes down here because I'm going seconds to minutes. How are seconds and minutes related? Rashawn, 60 seconds is the same as one minute. And what happens right now is my seconds would cancel. I got seconds on the top, seconds on the bottom. This right now is actually in meters per minute, but we're not done. They didn't want us to go to meters per minute. What do they want us to go to? Kilometers per minute. Okay. Times. So now we're going to go from meters to kilometers. Where is the meters in this fraction, on the top or on the bottom? On the top, which means I want to put it on the bottom. I'm going to have kilometers on top. Most of you have memorized this. How are kilometers and meters related? One kilometer is what? 1,000 meters. And this is going to give me my equation. My equation is going to be 75 times 60 times 1 divided by 1, divided by 1,000. Although, Rachel, do I need to times by 1 and divide by 1? It's going to be 75 times 60 divided by 1,000. And by letting the units line up for me, the meters cancels as well, I'm left with kilometers per minute. It tells me whether to divide or multiply by just making sure the units cancel each step of the way. If you're a little bit, ah, I'm not so sure I like that, you can use the previous method, methods. I'm just concerned with, hey, can you get the answer? Not use this method or that method. Meanwhile, what is the answer? It's going to be 75 times 60 divided by 1,000. 4.5. 4.5. 4.5 what? Units. Kilometers. Per minute. If you're traveling 75 meters every second, in one minute you'll cover 4.5 kilometers. And in answer to your question, Jacob, this method shines when you're converting both sets of units. The top units are changing and the bottom units are changing. It's a lot easier to keep track of stuff. Although I've seen people that just still do these intuitively in their head, no problem. Turn the page. We reviewed this already, but really quickly, a quick review of slope from Math 10. So in this unit, we're going to be using the concept of slope, the steepness of a line. Recall that slope, symbol M, was rise over run, and I already included this a couple of days ago. It was y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So consider the line segments A, B, and C, D. Find the slope of each line by using rise over run. You know what? We're going to do the slope of one of the lines using rise over run, and we'll do the slope of the other line using the formula. What's my rise here? For me? I find if I'm doing slope 
I find it very helpful to draw that. It gets rid of my counting mistakes. So you can, I would. On a test, I always do, because I find most common mistake with slope, I count it wrong. Three over, what's the run? Six. Although I probably wouldn't write it as three over six. What would I write it as? One over two. Oh, positive or negative, and how do I know? Uphill. This one's going to be negative. If I use rise over run, I'd have to add the negative. But we're actually going to try using now the actual slope formula. Now, the slope formula says y2. You know what? Is it written right there? It is. I'm not going to rewrite it. Nope. Uphill is, we said this. Always to the right uphill is positive. Always. Always. It's defined that way. Heading to the right uphill is positive. Heading to the right downhill is negative. Okay? Now, do me a favor. Let's label this point here. This point D is what, comma, what? Count, please. I'll give you a hint. I think the x-coordinate is uh, 10. What's the y-coordinate? 2. What's this point right here? What, comma, what? What's the x-coordinate? 6, yes? What's the y-coordinate? 5. So we could go rise over run, but they also want us to use they also want us to use the formula. So let's see if we can get the slope using the formula, and we'll check to see if we're right using rise over run. Y2, that's the second point's y coordinate. What is the second point's y coordinate? Find the second point. Tell me the y coordinate. That's what y2 means. I heard it. 2 minus y1 is the first point's y coordinate. So here's my first point. What's my y coordinate? Yep. x2. That's my second point's x coordinate, which is what? 10 minus. So the slope of this is 2 take away 5, negative 3 over 10 take away 4. Sorry, 10 take away 6. Whoops. 4. Slope is negative 3 quarters. I'll be honest. If they give me the graph, I'll go rise over run. It's faster. I would have used this method, draw a little triangle. If they give me the points, though, I don't want to go finding some graph paper and graphing it. If they give me the points, I'll use the slope formula. Zach, did you have a question, or you just... No, oh, okay, sorry, I thought I saw something out of corner of my eye. Part C says, hey, does the matter if the slope in Part B is calculated using the two endpoints of the line or two points found anywhere on the line? You can use any two points to find the slope. Zach, do me a favor. Oh, he is alive. Okay, sorry, my bad. You know what? I'm concerned about learning. So, don't worry about C. Yo, almost, what, 10 more minutes. Okay. Example 7 says, complete the following statements. Slope is a measure of the blank of a line. What did you learn last year? What does slope measure? Steepness. Let's put that word in there, please. Slope is the ratio of the vertical change called the blank over the horizontal change called the blank. Slope was what over what? What did you learn last year? Rise over the run. Okay. Shane, this next one's for you, part C. It says this. A line segment which rises from left to right, which goes uphill, has a positive slope or negative slope? What did we just say? Yep. Y2, 
What about if it falls from left to right? If it goes downhill, negative slope. A horizontal line segment has a slope of, so what did we say? Remember the skier analogy? Horizontal, how fast will a skier be going? Slope of zero. Vertical line, skier dies. Another word for dies in math was undefined or no slope. I'm going to use the word undefined. I found when I say no slope, kids hear the word no as the number zero. No, it's not a slope of zero. It's undefined. Okay. And don't worry about G. Home pause. So, can you turn to page seven, please? Page seven, please. I crossed out. G was not, G, I crossed out. I think number four is fair game. Number five is fair game. I'm assigning it. I'm circling it. Look up. Six. So four, five, six. No. Seven. Eight. Skip, 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 skip. No, we'll pause there. Four, five, six, seven, eight. It's math. How could it not be fun?